All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for joining. This is the uh, fall 2023 meeting of the New England Music Library Association. Um, <clears throat> my name is Terry Simpkins. I am uh, Director of Discovery and Access Services at Middlebury College in Vermont. And I um, have somehow found myself as chair of New England Music Library Association for the year, um, which I guess goes to show what happens when, when you run for a position and are uh, unopposed. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm the current chair of NEMLA. Uh, I'm a long, uh, my current job is not strictly music related, but I am a long time music cataloger and I got my start in music libraries and I've been a member of MLA and NEMLA uh, off and on for, for decades, honestly. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to be getting back into uh, more music library related activities. Um, I'm also a co-owner of a contract music cataloging business. So I've been doing that right along my whole career. Um, but that's me. I would like to give a quick introduction to the other officers of NEMLA. Um, we're all, many are new this year, some are new this year, and I don't know if everyone is aware of who they are. And um, first off, I'd like to uh, give thanks. Uh, Memory Apata is the past chair. She was the chair last year. Uh, Hannah Farello, I believe, is secretary treasurer. And uh, Patrick Quinn is our equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice um, uh, member. Emily Colucci is a member at large. Jennifer Hadley is our newsletter editor. Peter Lawrence is our web editor. And Judy Panolis is our vice chair and chair elect and uh, chairperson of the uh, program committee in that role as chair elect. Um, and it is Judy's incredible efforts uh, that have brought us this meeting today and uh, our spring meeting, which is also scheduled. We have a really good, interesting meeting plan today um, on the unfortunately all too timely topic of censorship. Um, and I, I, I can't say enough about Judy. She came in a couple, a couple months ago and just like hit the round, ground running and you know, within weeks had this meeting planned and m the ideas for topics. And uh, shortly after that, she had pretty much the date and time planned for our spring meeting. So I want to give a huge shout out to Judy for her work in making this meeting a reality um, today. Um, on that same, in that same vein, yeah, huge, huge claps for, for Judy. Thank you, Judy. Um, also, uh, our spring meeting has, we have a date and time for that and a place uh, that will be Friday, May 31st, uh, 2024 at Smith College in Massachusetts. Many thanks to Marlena Wong uh, for agreeing to host uh, the festivities at Smith. That will be an in-person, I think it may be hybrid, um, but you know, I hope, I encourage everyone to, to attend in person if you can. Um, I would also like to make a pitch um, for everyone to consider participating in some of our committees. If you have any interest in any of our committees, whether it's technical services, or the Equity and Diversity and Inclusion and Justice Committee. Um, we also have a, because we're planning the spring meeting, we really need people on the program committee. Um, we've put out a couple of calls on the, on the list and I know we get a lot of email and they might get lost. Uh, it, most of the current program committee members have been serving on that committee for quite a while. And I think some are interested in rotating off. Um, so, Please, if you if you're all interested in programming or in, in brainstorming ideas for the spring meeting, please let either uh, me or Judy know of your interest. We'd love to have um, you know new folks on the committee. Um, that would be just a, a, a huge boost. So please consider that. Um, we also have an opening for a NEMLA archivist. So if you have archival experience or if you know anyone who has archival experience and might be willing to serve in that role, I'd appreciate all tips, uh, clues. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to cold call, but I, I don't know who to cold call at this point. And, and, most, and the people I've talked to so far, are like most many of us sort of flat out and weren't able to do it. So uh, any ideas for that, filling that role would be appreciated as well. 
Um, finally, I wanted to just say we have a little unscheduled time today from 1.30 to 2.00. Um, obviously, this is, you know, just kind of a, a chance to schmooze, schmooze and um, get acquainted. And I, I don't know how many of you were at last fall's meeting, but one of the things we did discuss then, uh, sort of thinking about the state of our annual meetings, um, was how we can, you know, try to come at programming that is relevant and useful for the membership. And um, one of the things that we talked about was setting aside time at these meetings to brainstorm ideas. Um, so, you know, obviously the, the, the half an hour from 1.30 to 2, we can use any way we want. Um, but, um, you know, if, if people have ideas for things they would like to see at our spring meeting at Smith, um, that this would be a great chance to, you know, toss some ideas around and uh, maybe think of hot topics or anything that's of, of interest in the music library uh, world. So um, please feel free to use that time for brainstorming if if, if you're in, so inclined. Um, I think that's it from me. Um, I, without further ado, I will turn things over to Joanne Fuchs, who will do the introduction for our first presenter, I believe. All right, thank you so much, Terry. Hi, welcome. everyone. I'm Joanna Fuchs. I am the Metadata Coordinator for Arts and Humanities at Brandeis University. And I want to thank Judy today for allowing me to be your moderator for this first session. Today, we have a wonderful talk by Joyce McIntosh. Joyce is the Assistant Program Director for the Freedom to Read Foundation, an organization dedicated to First Amendment education, litigation, and advocacy. She has worked at the intersection of intellectual freedom, communication, and the First Amendment for three decades. Her background in education in journalism and library and information science have led her to work for newspapers, nonprofits, and for the last two decades in libraries. She worked in a public library outside of Chicago, Illinois, providing reference, programming, outreach, and assistive technology before joining FTRF with FTRF and ALA, her work has focused on education about the First Amendment and censorship, and how do we help libraries navigate challenges in their school and public libraries. So today, Joyce is going to present on these topics, and I will be moderating. I will be watching the chat for questions, and we will have time at the end for a Q&A session. So, Welcome, Joyce, and we look forward to hearing all about our First Amendment rights and in the library world. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and just see if I can get my screen. Can everyone see that just fine? Very good. Well, thank you for inviting me. I didn't realize Judith was new to her position. So if she's only been doing it a few months, you can all rest assured that she hopped on it immediately. <laughs> So I appreciate the invitation so much. Um, I do use a slide deck and if there are illustrations on the deck, I want to note that they're by an illustrator named Jacqueline Sinquette for my neighbor and friend, Lisa Katzenberger's book, It Will Be Okay. And this book, It Will Be Okay, is a children's book that came out during the pandemic. And I thought this could not be better timing. And I found that her book and the illustrations were appropriate for that time. I find them helpful when I'm grappling with our, our just uh, deluge of challenges right now in scary times, but I also find the message hopeful. So I just always like to give her credit and she always has given me permission to share her images. All right, um, some of what I'll go over today, many of you as librarians will be familiar with some of this, but hopefully you also come away with something new that you can apply either in your workspace or in your community. Certainly we'll talk about what's going on around us, um, a little bit of background about the law related to First Amendment. I'm not an attorney, therefore anything I say is informational. Um, what 
the process is when a title's challenged both internally and outside of our workplaces. And most importantly for all of us right now is how to empower advocates. Um, and please, if you've got thoughts or questions, type them into the chat, but I won't see them while I'm speaking. I'm glad to go back afterwards or Joanna have you assist with uh, Q&A when we're done. Um, all right, so I don't usually start presentations by showing my arm, but when I was thinking about free expression before speaking with all of you, I, I thought a little bit about the fact that I know why I got this tattoo and I know what it means to me. I know why the staff at the bottom is empty and I know why the high note from O Holy Night is on top. Some people look at my tattoo and they're like, ooh, that is a big gay tattoo because they see a rainbow. Some people look at my tattoo and they're like, oh, bless your heart because they see a Bible verse and they see a dove. And as librarians, this concept of providing access to information and not judging content and not trying to figure out why people want the information that they're gathering or checking out or using is clear for us. But so often that knowledge isn't clear for our trustees, sometimes our library staff, our students, our patrons, our community members, especially it's not clear to those who would censor a piece of music, an image, or other library materials based on their own viewpoint discrimination. So during this time, it's our job to help them understand. We help them understand what a library is and our First Amendment protections to use information, help them understand the tools that they can use um, to ensure that censorship doesn't get in the way of their right to choose the materials they want. Um, and I hope that we can all think of ways to reach those communities with that message in a clear, nonpartisan, supportive way so that we all have uh, access to information. So I'm from Southwest Michigan. I call this my hockey stick statistic. It was flat for so long and we've seen this huge increase. And I feel that we've gone from what I call challenges 1.0 to 3.0 in a pretty short period of time. We started out with a one-on-one -on -one challenge. A patron may come to me in the public library and say, I don't like Harry Potter, it's witchcraft, get it out of here. And you'd have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and explain why there's something for everyone. Can we help you find the book for you? If they weren't satisfied, we do have a process you can follow. Here's the form. Then we moved into the second phase and this is where this is no longer a flat line when organized groups began submitting, say, 10, 20, 100, 200 titles, circumventing library policies and procedures and bringing on a whole new method of challenges. And then finally, now we're seeing challenges 3.0, where we're seeing censorship legislated. We're seeing states trying to come up with legislation and pass it that promotes censorship. Um, uh, one thing I didn't touch on here in that sort of all three of those stages, and what's hard is that as librarians, we have to be prepared for any of those at any time, regardless of in our environment. Now there's more criminal complaints targeting library staff and educators. Um, most of the content in our school and public libraries that's challenged relates to race or LGBTQ content or like sex education and anything with sexuality in it. 
um, we're seeing more disruptions. I would note though, we're not seeing an increase or a big increase right now in academic libraries, even at the community college level. What we have seen are some challenges with staff um, and then also some challenges to curriculum. But so far, it hasn't hit. The concern, though, is that because we've got this gamut of ways to challenge content out there, I think if it does start, it will be rapidly increasing. Um, I'm going to share a couple of basic definitions just so we're all on the same page as I throw out terms. Intellectual freedom, the right of unrestricted access to information and ideas protected by the First Amendment. And censorship is the effort to ban, label, or restrict materials. I like noting this because often people say, well, it's not censorship if it hasn't been pulled from the library, if the book's not being burned. Um, I encourage you to report any activity where someone is making it clear they don't want people to have access to something. And I, I like to add that if a policy or a decision to purchase something is designed to limit materials, and those materials are ones that fit into our collection development policy, chances are that censorship. A couple of documents that I also have been pulling out a lot. Um, with the side note, sometimes, you know, uh, we're hearing, oh, the liberal librarians are just starting this movement now. It's like, no, these, these ethics and these codes of ethics that we rely on in our profession have been around since 1939. And sometimes we may feel like we're on a little bit of a tightrope because we are called to provide materials and information presenting all points of view, current and historic. And also now some of you may be thinking, well, in my library, it's, you know, the exhibits and the meeting rooms aren't necessarily as critical. Um, but even if we open up our social media, we are making that a limited public forum. If we open up our exhibits, if we open up our meeting rooms. So we have to make sure that we have these time, place and manner rules that we are allowed to have within our first amendment access for patrons. Um, we have to make sure that they're applied equally, that they're updated and that we have thought through what is our policy for filming in the library? What is our policy for exhibits? What is our policy for patron behavior? And can we apply this equally across the board? The ALA Code of Ethics, also from 1939, we didn't come up with this last year, has many of the same values in it that I appreciate. We did within the last five years, um, ALA colleagues did come up with the ninth code of ethics. And this one calls us to uh, advance racial and social justice in our libraries, communities, profession, and association through awareness, advocacy, education, collaboration, services, and allocation of resources and spaces. Again, we can provide this balance. Our libraries and our educational spaces can be welcoming to all, supportive of all, and also providing a breadth of materials. Um, uh, I want to think briefly about our boards of trustees. Some of you may be in a public library. Most of you maybe in an academic institution or a special library. Um, 
Regardless, you may have trustees, whether they're governing, governing the entire university or just, you know, working with your dean who's then working with you. But ultimately, we are trained to be able to curate this collection, to determine who our community is, why we make the decisions we make, the wonderful and interesting and educational and fun programming, et cetera, that we provide and the help we provide. These trustees are coming up with policies often. So it is critical for them to have that education and for us to make sure those policies are precise and up to date. Um, in the Q&A, we can talk a little more. I realize some of you may have internal policies specific for your library, and that is excellent because those policies can remain in place and firm and steady for a long time, whereas trustees turn over, trustees get elected every few years, and if your policy is residing there, it may become much more complex. Um, when you're creating your collection development policy and your reconsideration policy, if someone doesn't like the music or materials or scores or art that you're providing, when you write these or update these, think about the community you're serving. Often in a public library now, they may say only card holders. If you're at a community college that also serves a region of your community, you may or may not be required to say, okay, anyone in this region can bring a challenge. Or you might just be able to say only registered students may bring a challenge. So think about the community that you're in. Think about those boundaries. Um, and then make sure the, the process is written out for reconsideration and transparent. And this is another thing that I never thought of a few years ago, but now I um, suggest there should be an end to the process. You either say the library director's decision will be final, or you may appeal to the board of trustees. Their decision will be final and say how long that decision will remain. We will not revisit this material for X amount of time, or it will be removed for X amount of time. I wanna talk a little bit about student rights. Now, what's interesting is that many of you may be working with adults and young adults, and that is another reason we have not seen the level of challenges in our university and college uh, libraries and special libraries because we're dealing with adults. Um, those of you in a public school, sometimes parents are like, no, we have rights. And usually they do. Usually there's an opt out option. But when it comes to First Amendment cases determined by judges, judges have favored the First Amendment rights of students and that they don't lose those rights when they walk in our classroom doors. But what if you have someone still saying that this content is harmful to minors or pornographic or obscene, or you may have kids in school and their school district may have parents standing up reading one racy sentence or holding up one image. The fact is these are legal definitions and saying it doesn't make it true. Some people may feel my tattoo is obscene or that the lyrics by Megan Thee Stallion, I might note that Megan Thee Stallion is in like the top three percentage of swear words in her musical content. But just saying that content is obscenity does not make it true. Um, if a challenge ever got to this point, 
a judge would say, well, you have to follow your collection development and reconsideration policies. And frankly, if a group has tried to circumvent those, you don't have a challenge. You must follow your policies. And then they would look to the Miller test to determine if content is obscene, and they would look to another to determine if it's harmful to minors. Points two and three, or yeah, points two and three of the Miller test note that materials must be taken as a whole. You cannot say because the lyricist dropped that F-bomb, it's obscene and we should label it and we should segregate it in the collection. A material must be taken as a whole. It must meet all three of those criteria and a judge would make that decision. So far with the books that have been challenged, no judge has declared that any of these titles are obscene, pornographic, or harmful to minors. And that is one of the things that gives me hope in this time of many, many challenges. The fact that our judges and our courts are currently relying on the First Amendment and case law to make these decisions. Ginsburg versus New York, that's the one that wasn't at the top of my mind. Um, if a judge determines that something is harmful to minors, they'll use the Miller test, but they'll adjust it for age. And they'll adjust it to the highest age in that group. So when a parent is looking at a school district and saying, my kid could be reading gender queer, and we're looking at their kindergartner going, no, your kindergartner doesn't have access to that. The librarian has determined where to catalog it, where it properly belongs, and that's where it is. Um, so why should we be out here, even if our libraries are not facing challenges, what can we do and why should we be out here pushing for advocacy? And after the last few months, my answer is always so clear. It's because our libraries should not receive bomb threats. Our librarians and our colleagues should not get fired because of a small group's loud viewpoint discrimination. We should have the right, and we do legally have the right, to adhere to our collection development policies and provide access to the amazing tools and resources and scores and opportunities to learn and hear for all of our patrons without being nervous about whether someone's going to disagree with that concept. I wanna note a new study that's coming out. This is focused on classrooms. It is focused on books. But when I was thinking about whether or not to scrap this information, because I'm speaking to you as music librarians, I thought through the difference in a child having music and hearing their culture and having a musician or singer, songwriter or poet who looks like them, touch them. And it's huge. And first books led this diverse classroom impact study. And they did find what we, what I imagine many of us had assumed, but they have thankfully studied it and have statistics that increasing access to diverse books in the classroom increases the amount of time children spend reading and it impacts their reading scores in a positive way. And finally, that a majority of students who choose to read diverse books that serve as mirrors and where they can see themselves that's what they gravitated towards, that opportunity. And when I look at the list and the content of what's being removed from our school libraries and our public libraries, and now our public libraries are facing as many challenges. 
it used to be just K to 12 public schools, but now, unfortunately, public libraries are equal in this. That's the content that's being removed. Those are the topics that are being threatened when people try to pass legislation. The people of color, the authors of color, the ability to see yourself, uh, those in the LGBTQ community being able to see their lived experience and their history. Um, so we're at this point now where we must all become advocates and help other people become advocates. Um, the key is right now is to run for your local school board or library board. If you have an election up at your school, Please encourage, well, and you may not be able to stick your neck out or say a single word in order to not show preference for a certain dean or president or person who's running for office. Um, get somebody else to encourage supporters to run for boards. Um, let me talk about the various entities that I work with. And then I want to also talk for a few minutes about Unite Against Book Bans and the purpose behind that initiative. Um, so I work with the Freedom to Read Foundation and the word that separates us from ALA is litigation. We are a separate nonprofit. We can focus more heavily on the First Amendment. That means sometimes we can be a little more edgy and a little more involved, and we can litigate. And in this time, we are doing more of that than ever. We're helping people with HB 900 in Texas. We are assisting several folks in Florida. We will join a brief, we will write a brief, we will provide expert witnesses and testimony. Um, and therefore, I encourage people to look into the Freedom to Read Foundation. If you find yourself in a situation in your community where there are people who are saying what's going on is not legal, and we have some people who would want to bring suit because information has been removed from them, call us up, let's have a conversation and find out what's really there. Um, the ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom. Again, I encourage you, if you have any form of situation, uh, recently with a community college, we had a person reach out to me and you, all of this is confidential. The support is confidential. I will never say, oh, Judith, Terry called me last week to talk about such and such. No, and if you want to send it in on your Gmail account or your Yahoo account, please do to avoid FOIAs. Um, but reach out with anything. So this instance in a community college somewhere in the United States was where a staff member said, I'm not going to catalog these materials. This does not match my theology. I'm not comfortable with this content. Therefore, I'm just not going to catalog it. I'm not going to do it. And in that situation, yes, you have censorship. You also have um, you know, an HR situation at that point. Always the key is to remain calm find the solution and address it in a practical way, um, which can be hard when you're like, oh my gosh, this is censorship, it's reached me. But if you run into a situation, if you see where someone is taking down exhibits, please report it. Uh, that way, and you don't even have to ask for help. There's a checkbox if you want to have a conversation. Um, but Office for Intellectual Freedom staff uh, keep statistics so we understand what's taking place, where in the country, what's being challenged, and what groups are bringing these challenges. The Merit Fund is another one similar to FTRF where many people aren't familiar with it, but it's so important. 
If you know of any library workers or librarians who are experiencing discrimination in the workplace um, or whose jobs are threatened due to their defense of intellectual freedom, they can apply for a grant. This is separate from ALA, separate from FPRF, and a grant will help them maybe cover COBRA for a month or help them pay for housing for a month or medical bills. Often this grant is used to retain an attorney. And if they need to come back and ask for additional funding while they're looking for employment or whatever, they can reapply. It's not a one-time thing. And Unite Against Book Bans. Um, so about a year and a half ago at ALA, we, those of us who do challenge support were just realizing over and over again that especially school librarians weren't able to be the ones standing up against censorship. They were often worried, my principal said, remove these books, don't talk about it, et cetera. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to go against you. Know, and we would never advise anyone to, you know, die on that hill, basically. It's like you need to protect your job and whatever you can and reach out for help. And so because we were seeing more and more of this, we wanted to create an opportunity for community members to be advocates get educated and show up. So Unite Against Book Bans shares nonpartisan statistics. It includes an excellent challenge toolkit with letters to the editor, talking points, um, information on how to attend a school board or public library board meeting. And if people in your community, I always tell folks, it's like, talk to your in-laws, talk your siblings, talk to your parents, talk to your faith leaders, anyone in your community or your school supportive, encourage them to sign up because if they include their zip code, if there's a problem in your area, and if a librarian says we'd like help, we'd like people to show up, we'll send an e-blast to members in that zip code saying, this is who's asking for help. This is what they want. Here are some talking points. So it's become a great advocacy tool. And I encourage you to share it. Um, let me see. Uh, I covered all of that with Unite Against Book Bans. I would also recommend if you're checking out the website, please look at our national partner organizations because they're so diverse and so broad. And this initiative has helped ALA work with a wide variety of communities. Yes, our organization is here to support you and all librarians, regardless of the type of library, regardless of where in the United States, regardless of whether a state has pulled away from ALA membership, we will support any librarian. With Unite Against Book Bans, we have an opportunity to support community members and librarians. Um, we also, I have a colleague, Betsy Gomez, who used to work for the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, who works with our Office for Intellectual Freedom. And she now does community organizing, Unite Against Book Bans. She will meet with community members, help them talk about an issue, and find solutions or ways to advocate. Um, these are just a few of the talking points in Unite Against Book Bans. And what I love about these is the common sense approach. The fact that it's really hard to disagree if you're talking about having the right to choose what's right for me and my family, having the right to choose what music I listen to, having the right to choose what art we have in the library, what art we have 
you know, many of you probably have an exhibit hall or something of that sort. Having the right to choose what we view, check out, and look at for our family is key. So I'm going to stop sharing this, and I'm realizing I didn't talk about um, funding. Oh, just a second. It's not letting me stop share. All right. Um, is everyone still able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine, Joyce. You you froze a little. Okay, I'm still frozen. Um, bear with me one moment. I want, did the screen sharing stop or not? I can still see your screen, um, but I don't know if you're trying to open up anything. Oh, are you okay if I very quickly close and restart the Zoom? Uh, yeah, I think we, we're okay. Um, yeah. So in the meantime, while Joyce is restarting, because we've all had those amazing Zoom experiences, if anyone has questions, you can start to put them in the chat as we approach 1030. So as, like I said, Joyce, you go ahead, restart, and then it'll give um, our participants some time if they have some questions to start putting them in the chat. I think that she's off now <clears throat> and we are still recording so does anybody uh you have some questions in the chat is everyone able to see and hear me yes Yes, we very can. good. I apologize for that. I've I've got my network cable and everything this morning, but we seem to have a storm coming through Chicago land, and maybe that's affecting me. But I can see and hear you. Um, what I was going to note is that um, Judith had asked me to talk uh, briefly about funding and what we're observing, and at the moment when there are threats to funding, it has been to public libraries. Um, we've seen at least three full defunding attempts. One went through in Patmos Township in Southwest Michigan. Uh, an attempt in Washington State within the last few weeks failed. Um, so we're seeing threats to public library funding and at the moment, that's the biggest threat. I think the reason we haven't seen much threat, aside from legislation, for example, in Florida, but to colleges and universities um, and to schools, but with colleges and universities, it's because you're dealing with adults. Even if they're young adults, um, we're not seeing that threat. And often there are many more layers to attempt to defund or take money away from a college. For some reason, that hasn't been given the attention. Um, legislation is mainly focused on public schools and funding, and then communities are the ones working to defund public libraries. What is, of course, frustrating is that this may be a few loud community members. Uh, and again, that's where I've become quite the advocacy uh, pusher um, recently, just because at the community levels where we're needing to do that. But, um, and I, I welcome learning more from you because uh, that's just what I hear. But again, I'm 
I'm receiving more of the public library and public school challenges. Um, are there questions and what, uh, what are your thoughts, questions? I'd love to open up this time to have some conversation. Yeah, we have a question, um, Joyce, it's from memory. She asked, can you talk about the role of academic libraries in providing access to materials that are being censored in public public and school libraries? And then there was a follow-up, like for instance, if we offer access to community members, do we open ourselves up to challenges from the community versus our institutional affiliates? Mm -hmm. That's where it can get really complex at the university level. Um, usually you won't have those challenges because people aren't approaching it, but if you are in a college or university where you are open to the community, I would use something like um, the ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom has you know, challenge policies. We've got examples for universities. And you can use those as a good template, but then get very specific. Think through, okay, maybe yes, our community has the ability to use our library, but is it only students or only card holders that will let challenge materials? Often that relates to who's funding. Uh, recently, I worked with a community college that was part of a consortium. And their question was, okay, well, we're part of this consortium. We get guidelines from them, but we will still have our own collection development policy and our own reconsideration policy. Um, I realize that's not a specific answer, but it is important to um, be very specific and transparent and defined with your boundaries when writing those policies. Um, and so far, knock on wood, again, community members haven't gone after colleges because you can say, well, we are a college library. We are designed for people usually starting around age such and such and up. Now, there have been issues when there are high schoolers who are already gaining college credit and attending college classes, and that can get complex with curriculum. But again, usually with any school, there is an opt-out option at the K-12 level, and a parent can say, I don't want my child reading this. Please choose something else. Um, we have another question. Okay. It's from Susan. She asks, do you recommend any resources for public libraries writing a book challenging policy for the first time? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Oh, and someone said the Massachusetts library system as examples, excellent, very good. Um, please look to that. If you go to the American Library Association and just type in the search policy toolkit, that will give templates for public school and academic policies. Um, so both of those are good. The other thing I should note is that wherever possible, we work with regional and state leader. There are absolutely some states where right now they're not working with ALA. In those instances, or they may say our community members don't wanna hear from ALA. Well, we can write a letter of support from the Freedom to Read Foundation. We can write a letter of support from the American Association of School Librarians. Um, and also we will always work with a state library leader uh, or a state library association. Many state li library associations have a strong intellectual freedom committee. We will work with their members. 
uh, or the Intellectual Freedom Committee leaders for their school libraries. So wherever possible, we prefer to work with the state leaders and regional leaders. And often we'll touch base with you or your colleagues or community members, but often we'll be working with those state leaders in order to not have you taking the heat because you have to be able to continue to do your job. You have to be able to continue to go in and have this wonderful dynamic place or do the work you're doing. And challenges are taking time and funding and resources away from your libraries. So we, as much as possible, we try to work with supporters or area organizations like um, the ACLU or LGBTQ organizations. We will partner with them, especially if we get involved in litigation. And then we have a question from Judy. Have there been challenges to digital resources as well as the physical books in the libraries? Absolutely. And that is such a major challenge. With HB 900 in Texas, um, a judge has stopped that twice. Uh, the Freeman Reed Foundation is part of a brief in that. But they are attempting to take anything that relates to sex or, or sexuality at all declare it basically obscene and not let K through 12 students have access to it, including databases. And in a number of public libraries, people have said, wait a minute, you may not own this book, but if people want to go to this database, they can get it. Um, so that's a big concern. There's been one instance at least where a library shut down their databases and their eBooks entirely so that people couldn't get to a few of these titles. The problem is that this was a rural area with and with many homebound people and they couldn't get to their materials. At that point, you do have a legal case because you are preventing access to information that's protected by the First Amendment to your patrons. So again, legally there's hope, but it gets so much more complex when you introduce challenges to databases, challenges to curriculum. I should note too, I realize you are music librarians, um, but uh, you may know English teachers, you may work with in English department staff. The National Council of Teachers of English, NCTE, has a fantastic intellectual freedom office, and they work heavily with curriculum. And they have become such a good resource and great colleagues in this work. So please be aware that there are many organizations who can also help when curriculum is introduced, NCTE, when the law is introduced, FDRF and the ACLU, um, and Unite Against Book Bans. So as we move, before we move on to Ernie's question, I just had a quick question, Joyce. In this trend and what we saw your graph, have you noticed that this tends to happen more in rural communities versus more urban settings? or like geographic, or is the trend just across the country as a whole? The trend has become across the country as a whole. I am sitting in Cook County, Illinois. It is one of the most liberal strongholds in the United States. But at my high school district, there are parents from an organized group who show up every month and talk about the content in our libraries and curriculum every month. So far, they have not figured out that they need to fill out this form and go through this process. But 
what we've done with Unite Against Book Bans is create a group of us who have an online calendar and we fill it out and we have people sign up to rotate and go to those school board meetings. So there are always more people talking about the right to choose what their kids read in the library and the right to choose for teachers to choose what's in their classroom. So that's happening everywhere. However, I do want to know that everyone's community is so different. And you're purchasing a collection for your specific niche, right? Um, each of you may have a different age or interest group that you are providing information and music for. And that will affect your collection development. And with rural libraries, truly there isn't a cookie cutter way to approach fighting censorship. The talking points may need to be different. One librarian in a very rural area um, of Indiana explained to me, you know what, I'm not going to be able to have some of these most challenged books on display. It just would blow up. But what I can do is make sure that we own these books and if they get challenged and removed, that I have plenty of others with the same topics that I can share with patrons who need access to them. And if I can't get it here, I can make sure I know a way to get it for them. Um, and also with that, you get into patron privacy as well. In a rural area, it can be uh, even more critical to find ways to protect patron privacy. Um, that's where you don't want to be removing collections to a specially rated or adult only area. That's where you don't want to be labeling the music in an area where it's like, okay, no young person's going to want to go here and admit they're going here, or no parent's going to want to let their kid take this out. That's where restricting, labeling, moving materials can be a form of censorship. Thank you. So Ernie asked, has there been any response, positive or negative, from vendors themselves that has caused variances in how libraries can then support the public needs? Um, I don't know if some of you have been watching Scholastic in the last month. Uh, I'm seeing some nods and some shakes. Scholastic would be a sample of a vendor I'd use in this one where for a while, um, probably because of legislative initiatives throughout the country to restrict information, <clears throat> they decided to separate titles related to race and LGBTQ content into a sort of diversity collection. And before the Scholastic Fair or sale, they would say to the purchasing librarian or teachers, do you want this collection? Yes or no? Do you want us to include this collection with your regular bunch? Uh, thank you to uh, Susan who just shared this. Scholastic got so much grief and pressure because they were, in fact, censoring materials. And people would get those boxes when they'd choose the diverse materials. And they'd be like, this is not, you know, there, there's nothing here that we wouldn't add to our collection. Um, this is viewpoint discrimination. Scholastic this week reversed that and they're no longer going to do that. Um, this was by far the most visible example, but absolutely our database vendors are struggling and 
understanding how to do this. In some instances, if a library has said we're dropping like ProQuest or something, or we're dropping this ebook group like Hoopla, I'm using that as an example, not as one that occurred. Um, uh, like Brooklyn Public Library would say, okay, we're giving everyone open access to everyone can have open access to our databases. I mean, people are pivoting. They're finding ways to provide it, um, but it is so challenging for them too. I'm not excusing Scholastic. I mean, I was very thrown when they initially did that. I think many people are relieved that they have reversed it. And Terry has a question. Um, he asked, is it accurate to assume that public academic institutions are at more risk than private institutions are. For example, would the ability to challenge materials be more broadly construed to include taxpayers whose dollars support the public institution, as opposed to being limited to, say, people with borrowing privileges or to students? 100%. A private organization, you know, um, think about gay wedding cakes the bakery can say no i'm not going to sell to you any any private business or entity or corporation can say we're going by these rules anything and anyone publicly funded has to adhere to first amendment protections so our first amendment protections apply to government entities, um, whereas private entities, they don't apply. Is it our hope that in all of our private institutions, we are still adhering to these same values, still having the same policies and the same processes? Absolutely. But Yes, a publicly funded institution is much more open to challenges and scrutiny. Joyce, that's interesting because I was assuming the opposite. I was assuming that a public institution might, you know, might be just open to a challenge from anyone just saying, I pay taxes. I don't like these materials in my public institution. But you're saying because they're publicly funded, they actually they actually have more First Amendment, you know, protections than than privates do. So that's that's really interesting. And well, not... they'll get more challenges. They'll get more absolutely. challenges. But... They'll okay. absolutely receive more challenges and yeah. it's awful. Um, but it might be harder to enforce. protections them. don't really hit until you get to the point where something's going to court. Right. So you have to truly hope that your board who's elected, you know, you're hoping that they are against censorship, you're hoping you've been able to educate them to put aside their personal beliefs, not practice viewpoint discrimination, and uphold their fiduciary duty. Yeah. But the thing is, because it's that whole public government institution, they have much, you know, they're held accountable in a different way than the private organization. Great. Thank you. Joyce, kind of to follow up on kind of what Terry just said and what Memory had mentioned earlier, and this has kind of been in the news too um, in terms of universities, but restricted donations from big do like don't like board of trustees, and how does that play into kind of censorship? Um, or have you even seen that? Because I know sometimes, like I've like even special collections I've worked with, where you've had restrictive funds where you can only yeah. buy these materials, you cannot deviate. There's probably some of that, but we're not seeing it, and it's interesting because when it comes to funding and grants. We're seeing, and th this is good uh, in some ways, but we're seeing money roll in on both sides. This last Banned Books Week, and our theme was Let Freedom Read, 
because we needed to make sure people could have a truly accessible message. And this last Fan Books Week, we had sororities and private companies um, and author groups all engaging in this conversation and asking for trainings. So with this uh, increased media, with this increased attention, there are more people fighting censorship and putting their grant money behind that. So far, I haven't seen, aside from the public libraries where there's elected officials attempting to defund them, I haven't seen people withholding grant money. To some degree, I think there have always been those requirements and they are attached to the personal preference of the donor. But so far, it doesn't seem to be a big topic within challenge, within challenges. And then our last question we got from Judy. Um, some public libraries are offering open access to any students around the country to various materials. Have you seen any sort of censorship attempts on access to those open access materials? We have not. We have not. I'm sure the groups attempting to censor are not happy about those moves, but we have not seen people attempting to shut down that effort. All right. Any last minute questions? We are about at time. It is 1054, which gives us about five minutes for a quick break before the next session. So, all right. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me today. I truly appreciate this time. Thank you, thank you Joyce. That's terrific. All right. And feel free to reach out after uh, if anyone has questions or comments or Judith, feel free to get back to me if you have any reflections. This is great. A lot of information and a lot for us to digest and think about and um, activities that we can participate in and make things uh, uh, great for freedom to read and intellectual freedom around the country, not only in our individual libraries, but in our communities. So thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah. All have right. A, thank you and have a wonderful day of meeting. Thank you. I'm going to stop. Okay, bye.